Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. Do you want to have? Oh, there you are. Oh, you got what yeah. happened? Uh, I fell down some stairs. I'm just kidding. Um, I crashed my e-bike. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, Fuck, dude. Uh, yeah, it's okay. And I landed on my face, which is interesting. I've never done that before. And like on my hand. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, but it's one of those old Sondor's e-bikes from like 2010. So it's got the fat wheel on it. Mm. And I was trying to make a turn, and I just uh, it didn't do it correctly, and just right in the face. Yeah, Fuck. And I'm yeah. going to meet a client this week, uh, <laughs> like in two days, you know, and they're going to look at me and just think, um, I mean, look at me. I look like, I don't look like a writer. I look like I should be in prison. Uh, I don't know, man. You look like a Norman Mailer style writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good compliment. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You look like, uh, you know, immersion writer in bed. <laughs> Uh, hey, I was just reading, sorry for the delay. I'm, we're flying to LA in a couple hours. I was wow. uh, just uploading some shit and it, it was going slower than I expected. All good. Um, I was, uh, but while I was waiting, I was looking at uh, a profile of yours that you have somewhere on some ghostwriting website. Oh, it must be Reedsy. Reedsy, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned a prince that you worked with a prince who used to hang out with the rolling stones i love him yeah his name is prince stash well prince stanislaw klosowski Dorola. oh okay yeah. all right all right so what are you thinking of? uh i've got a buddy whose father was an italian prince who hung out with keith richards a lot um and salvador dali and uh bridget bardot and that whole crowd yeah. stash did too yeah. oh really all those guys that you just mentioned. Well, this guy died. Uh, his name is uh, um, Dado de Ruspoli. He was an Italian oh, prince. I know who he is. Yep. Sorry, let me get that off the table. Um, yeah, I, I know who he is. I think they were frequently confused. Um, you know, people would confuse them. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Multiple princes hanging out with multiple stones. Yeah. Not a bad life. Yeah, my buddy's um, his name's Tao Tao Ruspoli. He's uh, maybe how old is he? If I'm sixty, he's probably pushing fifty. Um, but he tells this great story about uh, his dad when when Tao was like eleven or twelve or something. His dad said, "Hey, come! I want you to meet my friend Keith. We're going to go down to a hotel and bring your guitar." And, uh, or no, he did he bring his good? I guess he brought his guitar. Yeah. And, uh, so they go and, and of course, Keith has a whole room of this, or a whole floor of a hotel. Each of the stones had their own floor, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're hanging out with Keith for a while. And, and Keith says, Hey, I see you brought your guitar. And his dad's like, yeah, Tal's been taking guitar lessons. Blah, blah, blah. And Keith says, well, let me see, let me see what you got. Like, you know, play some shit and Tal plays some stuff. And Keith says, Ah, you're good. You're good, kid. Uh, you should uh, you should learn to play flamenco, because if you can play flamenco, you can play anything. And Tao has gone on, and he's a great flamenco player. And he's like, "What wow. the fuck, man? When you're 11, and Keith Richards gives you some guitar advice? No shit. <laughs> you fucking take it. Yeah. Oh my god! If all of our kids could be so lucky. <laughs> well, that's pretty badass. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Stash was. Um, I flew down to to meet him this was years ago and uh, he's got like a 40 room castle north of rome and um oh he's italian called... as well yeah exactly oh. so he's italian and french he's a his ancestor is lord byron actually which is a, kind of interesting but i flew down there it's this huge castle it's called castello di monte Calvello. and uh yeah we just hung out for like 10 days and i wrote a book proposal with him and he would tell me the craziest stories like he would have you know, he told me about how he had a threesome with Mick Jagger and he like held his hand like this. He had, like, he had such a tiny cock. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh man, I can't put that in the book. I've heard he those rumors. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I feel like we're doing dueling print stories here. Yeah. Uh, Dado, so one day I'm hanging out with Tao. He has a, a house out near Joshua Tree. And... Uh, Sorry, there's somebody walking by my window here. Uh, anyway, um, 
he says, uh, he's like, oh, Chris, check this out, man. I, I just found this uh, passage about my dad in this biography of Salvador Dali. And he pulls down one of these huge, like large format books about yeah. Dali. And, uh, and there's this, uh, he reads this passage and apparently Dali had a deal with his wife where he wasn't allowed to fuck his groupies, but he was allowed to watch his groupies get fucked. <laughs> so he, when he had a groupie, he really wanted to, to see get <laughs> fucked. He would call in Tao's dad, who was famous for having the largest cock in all of Europe. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so Tao's dad, my buddy's dad, was Dolly's stunt cock. Oh, my God. Yeah. I didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. What a job, huh? Yeah, that's a hard that's a hard gig right there. Yeah. No pun intended. Hey, you know? hey, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll start this, and uh, I guess we we won't use the video, right? You don't you don't want the world to see you with your black eye. Oh, I don't care. Whatever you, you want. Right. No, it doesn't matter to me. All right. Um, let's see. So hold on. Oh, it's already sure. recording. Oh, cool. Oh, it starts recording automatically. I see. Okay. This is this is my girlfriend's account. No um, worries. Do you want me to to cut any of that? Do you want me to just start recording now? Anything you want. I don't care. You okay. can. All right. I'm an open book, man. All right. You well, can use anything. A ghostwriter <laughs> who's an open book. That'll yeah. Be subtitle. Yeah. That is that is a pun. Interesting. I never thought of it that way. But yeah, nothing's off limits. Um, I'm happy to talk about everything. In fact, I've been doing a bunch of interviews for the Netflix film, and each interview, it goes over like 15, 20 minutes. And they're just like, Alex, we want more. I'm sorry, but can we keep going? And I'll say, yeah, sure. No problem. And then at the end, I'm just like, shit, I just covered, you know, like 15% of, of the story, probably like 10% actually. So it's really nice yeah. to be, you know, in a podcast to tell the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what, so let, let me get, get a little bit about you first before we get yeah. into to McAfee and that whole sure. adventure. Like, how did you get where you are? I, like I said, I was just reading this this bio and it's like, OK, you're 20 years old. You're sitting in a cafe. You're writing a memoir about being homeless and uh, going up the inside passage, both of which I've done, by the way. Amazing. Um, and uh so what what makes a 20 year old think that he's in a position to write a memoir what the fuck it was a it was a stupid ass idea first of all i don't know <laughs> what i was thinking and it's funny i was 20 writing that memoir and then i finished it at like 21 i was like fuck that i can't i can't put this out in the world i'm so young so i yeah. shelved it and now i'm publishing that book and i'm 30 the same book but uh yeah with some additions so yeah i had a weird upbringing man like when i was a kid um, you know, I, I did really well in school. I did, I went to this academy, but I was more interested in just like reading and smoking weed and traveling and hanging out with my friends. So I was never at school and at this place, they would take points off your grade past, you know, 60 days or something that you missed. So every year, even though I would have had, you know, a, a normal GPA, I would have had A's and B's, um, they would just slash all of my grades, you know, not that I really cared because I never wanted to go to college, but, um, yeah, anyway, I guess it all started when I was a freshman and I was always obsessed with books, you know, instead of going to lunch every day, I would just hang out in the library because I was really shy as well. And I didn't want to be around all these people and sounds and crazy things going on. Mm. It was too much. So I would sit in the library and read books, but anyway, one day, my my guidance counselor, no, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. One day, I was going to class in a senior who was getting on a senior bus to some college fair. They were like, hey, Alex, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to class. They said, fuck that, hop on the bus. So I hopped on the bus. And the whole way up, it was about two hours, I spoke with the chaperone. His name is Mr. Humphrey. And he, uh, he and I talked about books the whole time, mm. classic literature. And whole ride back, pretty much. We talked about books. And then one of the seniors looked at me and they said, Alex, what are you doing on the bus? You're not a senior. You're a you're freshman. And I was like, fuck. So Mr. Humphrey just slowly turned his head and looked at me. He said, is that true? 
I said, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it is true. He said, oh, man. So apparently there was quite the commotion back at school because I signed in the homeroom and then I promptly just disappeared off the face of the earth. Long story short, they wanted to expel me. But Mr. Humphrey stepped in on my behalf and he said, you know, the whole ride up and the whole ride back, all we did was talk about literature. You know, he's a bright kid. I don't think we should get rid of him, you know. So anyway, he called me to his office and I went in there and I sat down. And he came in. He was holding a book, you know, Shakespeare, uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream, I believe, something like that. And some other, I think it was a, a bunch of books, actually, in one, a bunch of his. But anyway, he said, I have some good news. And I have some bad news. And I said, bad news always first. Let's let's hear it. Like, I'm, I bet I'm out of here. He said, all right, the bad news is, you know, you basically got two strikes in a row right there. You get one more and you're out, you're, you're expelled. And I was like, oh, that's not bad. I said, what's the good news? And he tossed me the book and then he gave me this piece of paper and it was uh, Time Magazine's top 100 books of the 20th century. Mm. And he said, here's one of them. And I want you to read all of these by the, the time you graduate high school. And I said, holy shit, that's a lot of books. But uh, I did, you know, and, and when I would go to the library from then on, I would have my friends create these little diversions in the hallway outside the library so that I could just pill for these books because I was broke and I couldn't afford them. Right. And I wanted to read so many that I, I had to take, you know, so many at once that I was just, I was going to um, rack up a bunch of library fees. So I, I nicked them, you know, and I stole the books and, and I kept reading them. And then I would give them away, you know, or stash them back in the library because there were no cameras in there. Anyway, after that, I, um, you know, I barely graduated high school and where, Mr. Where Humphrey, were you? Where was this you? is in Maine. This was in Machias, Maine. Oh, okay. Was this a private yeah. school or a public school? No, it was like a semi-private school. You know, it, it, it's a prestigious school and they take things very seriously. Yeah. And a lot of very wealthy people from abroad, they send their kids to the school. Yeah. I noticed you said you nicked the books. Yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> not American English. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've read a lot of books. <laughs> yeah. So of those hundred books, which five would you recommend to a young kid? Five. Oh, man. Like that. Because um, let's face yeah. it, no kid's going to read a hundred books these days. No. It's a hundred fucking podcast episodes. Yeah, maybe. it's a shit ton. Grapes of Wrath, uh, mm -hmm. Of Mice and Men, For Whom the Bell Tolls, um, A Clockwork Orange. There's another one in there somewhere. You should choose the last one. <laughs> so you've got two of Mice and Men and uh, Grapes of Wrath are both Steinbeck, right? Yeah, I love Steinbeck. He's so one of the give, greatest you authors. You Steinbeck two of your top five or four yeah. at this point. He deserves a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And, and uh, Hemingway, For Whom the Bell Tolls, the Civil War yeah. novel, really interesting book. Love that book. Spanish Civil War, I should say. Yeah. Um, and what was the other one? Clockwork Orange. Oh, Clockwork Orange. That's an interesting mm -hmm. choice. Yeah. Uh, I've seen the film. I've never read the book. It's crazy. It took me like four years just to read eight pages because mm -hmm. it's all slang. You know, it's a language that he right. created. Uh, and, and I saw that again with, uh, James Frey's A Million Little Pieces, uh, the memoir, which is not really a memoir, I guess it was, um, yeah, it was a, a lot, lot of, of controversy. Yeah, but he also created his own language, and I think that's incredible when an author mm. can do something no author has ever done before. Have you read much Joyce? Not really. I read Dubliners. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah, I like Dubliners. I think, I think that's all I read. Yeah, well, he does in his later work in uh, Ulysses, and and particularly in yeah. Finnegan's Wake, he just like goes off the rails and and invents language and and it's, it's super poetic and weird and you know if you read it looking for the meaning of the words you just get totally bogged down you have to sort of skim you know it's wow. like you know like, like those um those wakeboards you know like yeah. you have to be in movement to stay on to keep moving you know or, yeah. if you stop you just sink in yeah it's yeah. this intrepid momentum forward yeah i like that yeah, it's interesting. And it, it's a, it's interesting to do an intellectual exercise that requires you to stop thinking in certain ways. Yeah. 
you know, that's always a, it's sort of a Zen like endeavor. Yeah. And few books are written in that way. It's just like that with James Frey's a million little pieces. If you stop moving, then you, you sink, you yeah. know, if you keep moving though, and that's the pace of, of the, the whole book is breathless. You know, it's like you're living in the mind of a schizophrenic page by page hmm. and it's horrifying in a frenetic pace, but you just got to keep with the momentum. Right. And that's, what's so powerful about that style of writing. Yeah. I just thought of another good analogy for that, which is eating chilies. Yeah, that that's you a know? good. You eat yeah. something really spicy. If you stop eating, yeah, the pain hits. So you just have to Ooh. keep going and going and going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've never heard, uh, you know, someone say, "Hey, man, you got to read this book. It's so good. It's like eating chilies." <laughs> that would make me be like, "Fuck that!" Yeah, oh, it man, burns my going asshole, in and it burns <laughs> yeah. coming out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'd still read it, of course. My God. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. So, okay, so you you had no intention to go to college, though, which is unusual for somebody who's clearly yeah. got an intellectual bent and loves literature. Why not? Why not sort of follow that path and you know study literature in college? Um, I thought I would just kind of Kerouac my ass through life. Like I didn't really have any monumental goals for myself. Right. I just the only goal that I had was to see the world. That's right. it when I graduated and I was, I kind of disassociated from school because I found that there, I mean, the educational system was just so black and white. And I had a mind that I felt was very much in the gray. So it was like, oftentimes people were speaking a language that I didn't understand, or I was speaking a language I felt nobody else could understand. And therefore I wanted to find a way to to live in that gray and to thrive in that gray area. I just mm. didn't know how. So I thought, you know, instead of going to college, I'm going to travel for a few years and, and see if I can discover what that gray really means to me. Mm. And I did. And it was insane. Um, and an accident, but it brought me to, to where I am now, you know, as a ghostwriter, as an author. So what did you do? You just took off hitchhiking or did you get a, buy a used car or I built a solar powered tricycle with a friend of mine because <laughs> yeah it's Glad weird I asked yeah um <laughs> because I was always sort of obsessed with you know social and environmental change I wanted to do something good for the world at the same time mm -hmm. and so after high school when I was 18 I befriended this guy named Fred Thorne he was the local crazy he he had um two fingers missing from his right hand because they blew up from some homemade fireworks that he crafted. He lived in a solar powered dome at the edge of town, was missing, missing most of his teeth and uh, looked like a pirate. And anyway, I befriended this guy on Earth Day when I was 18 because I moved out of my mother's house when I was 15, moved in with my college girlfriend. So I lived at college and I was ghostwriting college papers when I was young um, uh, for money. Right. And just living the college experience. And that's where I met Fred Thorne. And we decided to build one of these solar tricycles together so I could film a documentary about social and environmental change, drive it across country from, from uh, Maine to Washington state. And I, you know, so I spent, geez, like seven months just researching and, and creating an interview list and, and meeting with, sorry, not meeting, but contacting luminaries in those fields. Like, Lester Brown, Bill McKibben, people mm -hmm. like that. And they agreed to be interviewed for, for the book. Sorry, for the, for the movie, getting ahead of myself. But uh, yeah, I, was, I built the trike and I drove it one day, 43 miles on a single charge on a cloudy day. And I didn't realize that the panels had been switched off. So I went 43 miles on a single charge mm -hmm. on this home built contraption. Mm -hmm. I thought, holy shit, I could probably go pretty far, you know, each day. So anyway, that was the plan. I called it Trek to Change the World, create a 501c3, was gearing up to leave, and then I crashed the trike oh. on a hill. One of the electric hub motors just like burnt out because I was trying to Rambo my ass up this very precipitous hill. So the trike crashed and because I was broke. I didn't have enough money to fix it at the time. And I thought like, you know, I've been sitting in this town for 18 years and I, I've wanted nothing more than to leave and to hit the road. So I said, fuck it, I'm gonna hitchhike instead. 
So I left the trike and I hitchhiked across country and ultimately became homeless in Los Angeles uh, for several months. And that was the life-changing experience. Why was that particularly life-changing? Because it was the first time that I really saw the desperation of, you know, humanity in its purest form. You know, that was the first time that I couldn't get bailed out. I had no choice. I was stuck. And so I couldn't go anywhere and I, I had no money. I couldn't do anything. I had to just figure out how to survive. And your and relationship it, with your parents wasn't such that you could give them a call and no, yeah. no, not with either. My mom tried to kill me when I was a kid and yeah, she tried again when I was 18, tried to drive me and my girlfriend at the time into a tree at about a hundred miles an hour because I was going to move out of her house and stop paying her mortgage. And she's just, she's always been kind of crazy. Mm. And so I, yeah, I never had the best relationship with my parents and therefore, you know, I was stuck. And at first I really loved it. You know, I loved meeting all these people and I found myself interviewing them subconsciously, not even realizing I was putting together material for a book or anything. I was just right. befriending them and learning their stories and who they were, how they got to be homeless in the first place. And for many of them, it was drugs or their, you know, Vietnam veterans that were just thrown on the streets because over there, the, the asylums and the institutions, they were overflowing. And when they overflowed, they had to just let people go right. without medication, without any direction. There, I read a newspaper when I arrived, Chris, it was 51,340 homeless people in LA County. It was a fucking city of homeless. Yeah. And coming from a kid from a small town of maybe 3,000 people, my God, you yeah. know? Yeah. So it was, it was nuts. And anyway, a, a lot happened there. Um, what year are we talking about? Oh God, this would be what it'd be 2012. It was 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, 10 years ago. Can't believe it's been that long. So you're only 28, 29 now? I'm 30. 30. Oh, yeah. wait, sorry. So it'd be 12 years. Wait, how old was I? Yeah, I was I was 19 when I got to LA. Right. Yeah, so that was uh, 11 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And it was really an incredible experience because I, you know, I had to have, I had to get money because I was broke and all these, you know, homeless shelters were really full and it was really crazy. If I would go there, there'd be like people getting stabbed, um, people overdosing all the time. A lot of folks with really severe mental health issues. And I would be a target because here I am this, you know, clean cut looking kid. They're like, what, what the fuck? What, what are you doing? Go, just go home to mommy and daddy. Like, you know, we're actually homeless, but I, I didn't have a choice, right. you know, and it was hard. I couldn't just explain that to somebody who wanted to kick the shit out of me. So I, I really avoided those places after a certain point. And I realized, man, I got to get a job. How am I going to get a job if I'm homeless? So every morning they would, they would arrest people who were sleeping on park benches and wherever they slept past 5.30. That was like the, the cutoff. Mm -hmm. So I'd wake up every morning around, you know, 5.15 AM and I had a backpack and I would sleep um, in a sleeping bag on cardboard because I learned that cardboard was an incredible um, material because it kept that cold from getting up into your bones um it was like a a poor person sleeping pad and so i i used the hell out of it but you know i would sleep outside and i'd roll up my sleeping bag and i would put everything to my on, on my pack and i'd walk over to this place called the talking stick cafe it was near venice beach and the staff there really liked me so they turned a blind eye when i went into the bathroom at like 5 30 in the morning i would wash up you know i'd get paper towels and i just clean myself put deodorant on, throw my old clothes into a plastic bag, throw that into my backpack. And then I would go to work because I got a job at this Argentinian, Argentinian place in Santa Monica and I would wait tables. And, you know, I just, I didn't look homeless, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I did that for months and I would just, <laughs> I'd go into work. I would wait tables. I'd get paid in cash. I'd get tips every day. And I'd go to the 99 cent store. I'd buy a bunch of hummus and bread and apples and I hand them out to some of the homeless people I knew and then I'd go back to sleep in you know my little hovel by the beach and I did that for a while yeah and that was a weird experience but um if you like I tell you the thing that that really kind of changed me yeah it was there when I was 
I was sleeping by this golf course. Um, it was near, it was like off Lincoln Boulevard somewhere. And I was, it was under construction, but they weren't doing any construction at night. It was all during the day, of course. And so it was one of the safest places in the city because it was by this really prestigious golf course where there was a whole lot of crime, you know, and, and there are these like, there's this fence alongside the golf course as they were digging up the sidewalk and over the fence, for some reason, there was a blue tarp. So I loved sleeping there because if it rained, I wouldn't get all that wet. Mm. But I got caught one night and I got kicked out and they threatened to arrest me. And by the way, I met a lot of people, a lot of home homeless people who had like scars and were beat up from the, from the LAPD. And so that plays into the next part. Um, so I decided to start sleeping on the beach and because it was away from all those people and was, I'd been mugged before there were a bunch of crack addicts around. So I slept on the beach, um, in Santa Monica and I could see the Santa Monica pier and it was always way colder on the beach, of course, because you would go to sleep by the, you know, down a sand dune where no one could really see you. And you'd wake up in the middle of the night and you'd be covered in dew from the mm, ocean, right. you know, so you really had to bundle up. And every morning I woke up, like my whole, my face, my hair, everything was soaked in a, you know, my sleeping bag would be soaked, but it was worth it. You know, anyway, um, I, I slept there one night and I woke up, it was like two 30 in the morning or something. And I woke up out of breath, like, <gasps> I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like I just hit something. And I thought, no, something just hit me. And I looked up and there's this guy. And he's wearing, he, he looked really sharp, you know, wearing a suit, looked like he just got out of a cocktail party or something. Black hair, slicked back, clean shaven. I couldn't see the color of his eyes, but they looked real dark. Um, anyway, he, he was, he said, get up. I was like, what the fuck? Like, okay, this is weird. I must be dreaming. At first I thought I was dreaming. Like, this is a weird dream. It's very realistic because I'm sleeping on the beach. And in the dream, I wake up on the beach. And then I, you know, I, I pressed my hand into the sand and my hand was soaked, you know, from the dew. And so all the granules of sand were sticking to my hand. I could just feel that. And I like squeezed the sand. I could feel that too. And then I knew, oh my God, okay, I'm awake. And I looked at the guy and he had a knife in his hand. He was holding it at his side. One of those big like Bowie knives, real like five inch blade or something sharp looking real silver because the only light out there was the moonlight reflecting off the water. Mm. And anyway, he, he looked at me, he was like, take off your pants. I was like, uh, no, no, dude, I don't think so. He, and he's like, take off your fucking pants. And I thought, Oh my God. All right. This just got real. This is bad. You're already and, standing up at this point or you're no, I was still, still sleep, you know, in the sleeping so, bag. Oh, all right. So he, you know, when he said that, I was like, all right, I'm going to have to run or I'm going to have to beat this guy up or God knows. And I just looking at his face, I was 19. I'd never seen like evil before, but looking at this face, I was like, this dude is evil. There's something real bad right there in those eyes, like a vacancy of all human emotion. Mm. It does not exist in this person. And I'd never seen someone like that. And so I, a million thoughts were racing through my head. And I realized because I'd been jumped before um, and I didn't have my boots on when I was jumped, it was, you know, I had to fight off a couple guys before I could finally get my stuff and like run away and like throw my boots on <laughs> as I, I was running away. And anyway, um, I had my boots on. I knew better now. So my boots were on. But even then I thought, my God, you know, if I'm run away, I'm running through sand. Mm. I'm not running on concrete. I'm not going to get very far. I'm going to be running through sand. It's like in those bad dreams when right. you're trying to run from something, but you don't move. Yeah. So all these thoughts were going through my head and I just, you know, I squeezed that sand and I started slipping the, the sleeping bag out from under me with the other hand, very consciously, like every single second was like a million seconds. And I leaned forward and I went to my belt. And then I just shoved that sand into the guy's face and I quickly like unfurled sleeping bag, basically stumbled into him as he was raising the knife. Like, Oh, what the fuck? He was raising the knife and I 
because I, I could barely get sleeping bag off me. I was stumbling into him, but I tackled him and I beat him up. You know, I hit him a lot and there's blood everywhere. And I thought, oh my God, I just fucking killed a guy. And I, I didn't just kill a random guy. I killed someone who looks like he's a lawyer or something, some hotshot medical doctor, um, someone with some power in this town, perhaps. And I thought, what have I done? Because the guy wasn't moving. And I was totally freaked out. I didn't know what to do. I grabbed my bag. I ran. I ran a third in Rose, which was the local homeless encampment where I used to spend a lot of time. I knew some people there. And there was blood on my hands. Mm. Literally, like I had blood on my hands. And I, and I was shaking. I noticed that. I was like, fuck. So I put them in my pockets. And I was like, I want to go to the cops. I might have killed someone. I got to tell them. I got to tell them. I got to tell them. But I didn't because I remembered what happened to some of my friends. They just, they got their shit kicked out of them. And I thought who are the cops going to believe some homeless, nobody kid, you know, or this rich dude. I was like, I'm going to go to prison for the rest of my life. But finally, you know, I waited until dawn and then I reasoned in my, I, I reasoned with my, myself and said, I said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to have to find out what happened to him. I'm going to have to go back there. And if, he, if the man is deceased, then I'm going to go turn myself in, you mm. know, of course. And I went there, um, I went there and I was scared, <laughs> you know, it was just my, my adrenaline, my adrenaline was just racing. My heart was racing. And I like got to the sand dude and sand dune. I crested the dune. I looked down and the man was gone mm. and there's blood there. And then there are footsteps leading over to the Santa Monica pier. So he got away, he left. And I, it was the weirdest sensation that washed over me. It was like relief, regret, because I thought this guy, he's done it before. And I'm not sure that the kids before him survived. Right. So anyway, um, that's it. That uh, I wouldn't tell that story for years. And the first person I would tell about it would be John McAfee, funny enough. Really? But, yeah. But I, after that, I wasn't sleeping, man. For, for days and days and days, I couldn't sleep. You know, I, I was terrified. And there's so much shit going on around me. I'm just all of a sudden I start hearing everything. It was a lot louder. Mm -hmm. um, at at my restaurant, the boss's eight year old kid. He like grabbed my ass, and I was like, "Whoa, what? Whoa, buddy! Like we can't do that. Like that's not acceptable." And he he said um, he asked me to go play doctor with him, and I was like, "No, man! Like who taught you that game?" And he smiled and he said, "You have to do what I say because my dad owns the restaurant, basically." And I was like you tell your dad to go fuck himself. And then I, I left, I just throw on my backpack and I left. And I was just, again, it was like a week without sleeping. And then one day up in the Hollywood Hills, I climbed the wisdom tree, they called it, which is kind of ironic now looking back because it gave me some wisdom. All right. And I was like looking out at urban sprawl, the last vestige, vestiges of nature, just getting engulfed by buildings and, you know, shopping malls and gas stations and like the loud drone of jet engines in my head and all of the smog everywhere and i just basically i saw the world burning mm. and snap i fell asleep i woke up and i i was crazy i was a different person i was afraid of everything and everyone i was just living this con constant state of post-traumatic stress every moment of every day these fight or flight impulses and long story short, I don't want to just keep rambling on, but this lasted for two and a half years, two and a half years of every moment of every day living in perpetual fear. And anyway, one day, the inside pastors that we talked about, I, I was like a, a vagabond for a while, Chris, for two and a half years. All I did was travel the world, take these random odd jobs, I'd go farming, I'd go fishing and I'd, I'd be in South America or Central America, or I'd be in Europe. You know, I, I crisscross America a number of times, just this purposeless, aimless vagabond. And I got a job. I don't know how they want to hire someone like me. I mean, just look at my black eye right now. And I'm now like known to be prestigious of some caliber as a ghostwriter. But uh, yeah, so back then, this very wealthy couple from LA, they hired me to be their sole deckhand and their server for four months at sea along the inside passage to Alaska. And <laughs> yeah, why would they do that? <laughs> Take one look at me, man. And you, you tell me if you would hire me for something like that. 
Did you they, have experience uh, on boats? Yeah, I, I grew up in Maine on the coast, so okay. I had my own boats. Um, you know, I grew up on the water. I spent a lot of time fishing on the water, lobster fishing and uh, okay. periwinkle harvesting. That's why they knew I had experience with that and that I could cook. So they brought me on. They were horrible to me. They're so, so mean. And it was 120 straight days of work. And, and mind you, I was fucking crazy. Every day, I just felt insane. Mm. And yet I had to pull it together and act like a normal person so I could cook for these people, serve their friends, um, you know, do all the boat stuff that I needed to do. And I told myself when I got on that boat that I was either going to fix my mind on that journey or I was going to find some quiet inlet or some beautiful cove someplace and jump off the boat because I don't know how to swim. And that was it. And so every day, you know, I worked 16 hours a day. Every day I would wake up, I would sort of meditate and I would, you know, I would have these really positive mantras in my head. I read this book called The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. I read it every single day for 120 days. Must have read it like 30 times. And I just started re formatting the software of my mind in some weird way. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I got off that boat uh, after the four months, put my feet on solid ground and I was in uh, Seattle and I looked at the airplanes and skyscrapers and the buildings and the machines. And it was first time in two and a half years, I was afraid of nothing Mm. at all. And Mm. it was that day I decided to become a writer. And within a year, I had my first ghostwriting opportunity. Mm. And strangely enough, I, I don't feel fear anymore. And I don't feel excitement anymore. Mm. Those two emotions, they went away when I put my mind back together again. And then anyway, I was this kid, I was 21. And I had all these stories. That's why I started writing the memoir. And that's so when what, Kathy Pelletier found me. Right. Now, before you, before you get into that, and I oh, definitely yeah. want to hear that, but I can't just let it roll by that you don't feel fear and excitement anymore. I mean, they're two words for the same thing, right? And, and yeah. A heightened state of awareness yeah. or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but I mean, when you're barreling down a hill on your e-bike, you don't feel a little fear? No. No, that, I didn't. That explains the black eye, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I was going very fast too, but no, I don't. And it's so bizarre. I mean, here's the thing about fear, right? Fear is connected to love. They are, they are two sides of the same stick, basically. Fear and love, they're so interchangeable. Oh, wait, I think. Un- unpack that a little bit. How are, yeah, they, sure. how are they two sides of the same thing? I just feel like they're two polar, uh, they're, two, they're, they're sort of polar opposites, but they're connected in some way. When you, fall, when you fall in love with somebody, I think one of the first things that we feel as human beings is the fear that we might lose that person. Right. So we fall in love, but we're also afraid of what happens when that love goes away. Right. Those two emotions are inextricably involved, you know, and connected. And so the weird thing is, what I'm trying to say is, after that, I didn't feel fear, but I felt love. I, I sure do. Like, mm. I feel a lot of love. But the fear part, you know, like, oh, my God, am I going to lose this gig? Or, you know, when I was broke and just struggling as a ghostwriter in the beginning and like I lost my only client and I was sick and I had no money. I wasn't afraid. I was more so determined. Right. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I kind of I frame that as I, I think I've lost the ability to fall in love, which liberates me to love more. That's a really excellent way of putting it. You know what I mean? It's like the yeah. falling in love is is loss of control and helplessness and, and also lack of responsibility, I think. You know, sure. uh, you know, the heart does what it wants. <laughs> like, oh, sorry, I fucked your mom, you know. <laughs> uh, whereas loving someone involves like being honest about your shit and what you're doing yeah. and how it's going to affect people and and all that so i guess i see what you're saying you know fear fear is an, is another way of describing panic another mm-hmm. you know like loss of control loss of responsibility like ah, i was afraid i didn't know yeah. i didn't mean it i sorry i said that i was 
reacting. Exactly. It's like, no, fuck that. You get to be a certain age, you've got to stop reacting. Yeah, you got to just own your shit. Right, and then you can own it. You know, exactly. You can, in Japanese, there's this expression, uh, by the age of 30, each of us is responsible for our face. Like you know, saving our face? Just the way it looks. The I mean, I don't know. It's We can interpret it in different ways, right? But my interpretation has been like, basically like, look, by the time you're 30, you got to stop blaming your parents. You stop blaming your bad luck, your good luck, whatever. It's like, no, nah, man. And it, 30 years is enough for all that shit to wash. And you yeah. get to the point where, you know, hey, it's on you now, right? Like, the sorry, you didn't you. get into Harvard, you know, or, you, you know, your mama didn't love you or, your, you know, whatever. Uh, I think of this song by um, uh, George Michael. Uh, there's this beautiful song where he's singing, like, about success. And it's like, okay, you know, your mama didn't love you enough, boy. Your daddy didn't pay enough attention to you. You need all this attention and all this stuff. And you know it's 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 uh it's called Star People. It's a great Star story. People. I'll yeah. check it out. Oh, it's really great. It really shows his perspective on what a bunch of bullshit fame yeah. and success is, you know. And uh, he's saying, "Don't hide from who you are. Like, don't hide." Yeah, and he's saying, "What is it that made you a star? What makes you a star is your your insatiable need for attention." You know, and this is George Michael saying this yeah, yeah. Like at the height of his fame <laughs> and, and success. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, that's that's getting way off topic. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, interesting. Okay, so so you got to this point where you're feeling like I, I love it's interesting how now I don't know if this is if this is just the way you're telling the story or if this is actually uh, how you felt, and, and I don't mean I don't mean to insult you by saying that, I, not that you're being disingenuous or anything, but I can tell you experience life in narrative, which is something yeah. that I do as well. Like even as the experience is happening, I'm thinking like, oh, this is an interesting story, you know? And like you talked about being homeless and how you were meeting all these people and sort of, you were already recognizing them as characters, which well, is to diminish their reality. Sure. Right? I wasn't recognizing them as characters then. I didn't realize, I didn't realize till many years later, actually, that I've always been trying to tell a story. Right. So just like you said, but I, I was doing it. I just wasn't aware that I was doing it. Well, you and were now, absorbing it as a story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you yeah. talked about like this, you know, you're up in the tree and it's like a, a switch flipped. And then you're in Seattle two and a half years later or whatever it was, and the switch flipped back. Was it that sudden or is that just sort of shorthand? Was it more sort of fade in, fade out? There was a bit of fade in, fade out for sure. The fade fade into losing my mind, basically. It was like that that week prior that I hadn't slept it was like right. eight days I didn't sleep and then the encounter with that guy and I would ju I just thought you know I'm just this naive kid what the fuck am I trying to do here you know I read all these books you know dozens and dozens of books and I was like my god like there's seven gallons of oil in every tire and in, the, in a car and like all these things were created these dead things were created by killing untold amounts of living things mm. it was just so oxymoronic to me and I was looking at it through this lens that I hadn't seen, that I hadn't been looking at it through before. And it was just this oxymoronic perspective of human nature and how we're just like building everything up to fall right back down. Yeah. And so it was just up in that tree that I finally got it. You know, I was like, Jesus, like, you know, I was thinking about, you know, how several football fields a minute are wiped out in the Amazon rainforest and how we're, we're, we're getting rid of all of our water, which is the one substance that we really truly need to survive. And, you know, we're, we're creating this artificial reality and this artificial world that isn't going to last. It's been built to fail because we're in a, on a planet with finite resources acting like everything is infinite when it's not. Yeah. And so this all like, boom happened to me, but it was definitely like a slow ride up that mountain, literally, I guess, but it was a slow burn and then boom, the switch 
flipped. It was like it flipped when I fell asleep because when I woke up, that's when I felt that way. Right. I, you know, it was just, it's so hard to explain. And then same thing with on the boat, probably like the, the week before I got to land, I was in a real serene state of calm. And I, I wasn't really thinking about being in that state. I was just living in the moment. I wasn't like questioning it. And then when I got off the boat, I realized that state of calm was like a new beginning. And that's when it clicked for me. And that's when the switch happened. I was like, oh shit, I'm better. I'm not afraid anymore. I just realized I'm not afraid. It was very ha weird. Had you been aware that one of the things you were afraid of was trying to make a living writing? No, not at all. I had no, no desire to make a living at it. I was writing for sure. You know, I was journaling, mm. but I didn't really discover writing until well, I discovered writing very young, but I didn't get serious about it until I got my mind back. And that's when I thought, I like this. And in fact, I love it. So I want to see what I can do with it. I'm tired of fucking around and just being a bum. I want to right. do something with my life. And how old were you here? 22, 23? So I would have been 21 and a half, I guess. Yeah, right. Almost 22. And so you get a laptop and you start, you mm -hmm. say, I'm going to write about the last few years. Exactly. Yep. I, I had 12,000 bucks in my pocket that I got paid when I left the boat, which was like the most money I'd ever had before. And I thought I'm just going to get an apartment, pay off like four months and just rent a room. I bought a typewriter, bought a laptop, and I just started writing like every day. Some days I would write for 17 hours. I'd forget to eat. I still do that now. Um, I shouldn't. Was that but, in Seattle? No, I, I came back to Maine, mm. got a place with some friends. And it was the first time I really hung out with friends in like two and a half years. And they didn't recognize me because they're like, dude, you're like totally different. You're like a different person, which is true. And I just started writing all day, every day. And hoping that I could write a book and get it published and maybe become a novelist, become an author. I just wanted to do that. Wow. So tell me about the cafe. Sure. That was another catalyzing event. So as I said, I was writing a lot and the money was, was almost running out. You know, it'd been like seven or eight months. And during that time, I had written a memoir and it was huge and it was 850 pages. <laughs> it was far too long, but I was revising it constantly, constantly. I like to hang out in the cafe because I was finally integrating myself back into society. And it was this comfortable place where I could pay at the, the counter, sit at the cafe. And if I wanted to leave in a heartbeat, I wouldn't have to wait for the bill. I could just like bow out for whatever reason. And I was there working on this book and this lady was with her friend. She came in. She saw I was writing and she peered in. She said, Hey, are you writing a book? And I said, I'm trying to, my God. And she said, Huh, can I check it out? I said, By all means, you know, here you go. And she looked at the laptop and she was like staring at the laptop and then like looking at me like, like that very suspiciously. And I was thinking, Oh shit. Um, she hates it, you know. But then she, she said, You wrote this? And I said, Yeah, I did. I did. And she said, How old are you? And I told her I was like 21. And she said, wow, I'm impressed, kid. And it takes a lot for me to be impressed. And then her friend chimed in. She was like, yeah, she's a bitch. And then her name is Kathy, the person who read my some of my pages. She said, um, I am a bitch. And I would later learn she can be a bitch, but I love her for it. Um, so anyway, she gave me her information. She said, you know, write to me, email me. I want to, I don't know, I see something in you, kid. And I want to help you. I want to help you here. So I did, and she became my mentor. She became my writing mentor, and I would send her stuff. She would critique it. She gave me so much intel on the literary industry. Mm. And then I started obsessing about how to write a query letter, how to write a book proposal, right. how to you know stand out among, amongst the crowd. And She's a writer, or, or she's in publishing, or what's her? Yeah, she's a novelist. So I would learn after that day that she's, um, yeah, she's a novelist. She's written 17 books. Um, she was one of the first people in America to get a million dollar advance for a book. Um, some of her books were turned into movies, very successful. She's a main based novelist. And so, yeah, that was a big catalyzing event for me. And then and I Stephen just kept running. King came in and sat down at the table next to you. <laughs> I wish my God, he lives down the road from me. 
I want to meet him someday. He wrote the only book about writing that I think is is worth agreed anything. I've never read a book on writing better than On Writing yeah. by Stephen King. It's yeah. just the only And I book. don't even like Stephen King. Like I've never read a Stephen King novel. <laughs> I've started a few of them because mm-hmm. you know friends have insisted or whatever, but uh but that book on writing is just so fucking good. It is. He's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. He's and it's brilliant. just short, sweet, and to the point. And it's yeah. part memoir, but it's also part, you know, this is how you should write. And I loved it. I learned a lot from that book. Yeah. I took a lot from it. So what's your what's the relationship between writing and ego for you? That's a great question. And you know what's interesting is that. I kind of describe my experience, those two and a half years of losing my mind, losing my identity, losing my ego. It was like the death of my ego. Obviously, mm. I got it back. Like I do, we all have an ego and I'm sure I have an ego. I don't think it's outsized. And I don't think it's very little. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. But that experience really taught me to throw my ego on the back burner. So with ghostwriting, you're trying to emulate this person you're trying to tell their story and the only way that you can truly do that is if you you set aside who you are whatever biases you have and i don't have many i'm apolitical i'm not religious i'm you know i i've read all the books you know i but i i have a very neutral stance on life but which has served me as a ghost but you got to set aside all of your baggage all of your conceptions and affiliations and whatever you subscribe to you got to set it all aside and that's your ego so when you work with a ghost sorry as a ghost when you work with a client you're becoming them you're pulling from their mind who they are and you're trying to basically wear that suit on your own body you know so it's really weird you got to let go of the ego in order to do that Right. So when you're ghostwriting, and I read in your your uh, bio there, you you sort of talked about a method actor like Daniel Day Lewis. You know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you're ghostwriting a piece, you're not. I mean, the McAfee thing was a profile of him, right? It wasn't as written by John McAfee, was it? Right. No, everybody always calls me McAfee's ghost because I'm a ghostwriter by profession. But our our um, agreement was actually that I was going to be, I was going to have my name on the cover. Right. So yeah, I was doing a profile exactly. Right. So you're in a in a situation like that. You're writing as you. You're writing in your style about yep. this personality and this situation and and all that. Totally. But there are other situations as a ghostwriter where your name isn't going to appear on it. Are you, when you talk about, you know, putting on the mantle of that person, I mean, and I don't know what the legal restrictions are of you talking specifically about projects that you've been involved with. I have a friend who's a very prominent ghostwriter and he can't talk publicly. He, he right. can't even say like, yeah, I wrote that book that you've all heard of, you know. That's part of the deal. Um, But uh, would you try to write the book in the voice of the person? So if you were writing like Kim Kardashian's autobiography, for example, auto in air quotes, (laughs) would you be trying to write in her voice? Nope. And that's an excellent question. And this is maybe controversial in the ghostwriting community but they don't have a voice. That's the, <laughs> that's why they're hiring you. Yeah, but that, exactly. But that's the thing. And what I like to tell people is that there are three voices in life. You know, we've got the omniscient one. That's the one inside your head. And it's still you. That's the one that really bothered me when I was crazy for two and a half years. It mm. pissed me off. It was very, yeah, it was not fun, that voice. But that's the omniscient voice. And then you, we, we have our speaking voice. This is how you and I are communicating right now. We're talking to each other. And then there's the third voice, which few people ever have. And it's the literary voice, because we have to take that omniscient voice and we have to take our speaking voice. We have to marry them together and create something that can be turned into the written word. Mm. And that's where I get a lot of flack because some, some authors 
you know, first time authors will say, I really need you to capture my voice. You know, I talk like this, I swear a lot, I blah, 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 I do this. And I said, you know, yeah, I get that. That's about like 50% of what I need to create for you. But the other 50%, it's totally literary. And only someone with a literary mind and a background can create that for you. You know, unless you want to spend years learning the craft and writing and journaling. Yeah, then you're creating a voice. Mm. And I can look at that voice. I can study those journals and I can replicate it. But most people, they just don't have it. Mm. So we, we ghostwriters, if we're doing our job correctly, we have to craft their literary voice for them. Have you studied other ghostwriters no. as opposed to writers? No, not really. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the ghostwriters I know, um, they're kind of hacks. They just, um, they interview and they take the transcripts and then they rewrite the transcripts and they're like, oh, look, I just ghost wrote a book you know, for you. I just created a voice for you. No, they didn't. They just interviewed them and then edited transcripts. That's not ghostwriting. And I think sadly in this industry, the majority of ghostwriters do that. The good ghostwriters, they have a whole process that they use to emulate the author and to craft a voice. Sorry, did I answer your question? I might've gone off topic. Yeah, no, no. I was just wondering like, because, because there is something somewhat secretive about ghostwriting um, in, at least in some cases, uh, and it's hard to know what's coming from the subject and what's coming from the writer. So it would be a difficult, it seems like it would be a difficult thing to study, you know, like to learn the art of ghostwriting as opposed to the art of writing. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's amalgamation. You know, you have to be a great interviewer. You have to be an effective mm. listener. You have to know when to steer the client back on topic, but you also have to know when to let them have their bunny trails because that's when you find the diamonds that are hidden somewhere in their brain that they right. don't even know are there. Right. And you have to be trained to find those diamonds and to bring them out. And then you have to do the other job, which is being a great writer and telling that story in the most engaging, effective way possible. And I imagine another part of it is knowing how to negotiate with someone who's got a very large ego and like there's a power play happening here right where it's like look i'm paying your bills i want you to write the way i want you to write this but you're saying i'm a professional you hired me for a reason you're gonna have to trust me that that story you just told is fucking gold and that's going in totally you know, or, hey, you know, no one wants to hear that shit that you just told me about. That's a bunch <laughs> of egotistical nonsense. Yeah. You know, like the, that must be a, a big part of the project is just negotiating the ego. A hundred percent it is negotiating the ego of your client and in the simplest terms without offending them, explaining that you are the professional, you know what you're doing. It's not something that you could even possibly describe in a passage in a book. It's really... Oh, God, it's, it's ambiguous, but here's the work that I've done. Here's the work that you love that attracted you to me. And I'm going to do that for you. So you just gotta, you gotta trust me on this. And it's just yeah. like that. And, and sometimes that, they're like, fuck that. You know, that's like, how the fine. jobs come. It's all because somebody's read something and they're like, Oh, I like the way this, this was done. Yeah. I mean, I get a lot of potential clients on Reedsy. Um, on one of the ghostwriting platforms that I'm affiliated with, uh, but the majority of my clients now come to me word of mouth, you know, so there, there's a colleague that told them about me or a friend or something or a past client, you know, Yeah, which is nice. I haven't advertised in like six or seven years, which is good. I like not wasting money on advertising. <laughs> I had a, an offer to ghostwrite a book a few years ago. This, this woman reached out to me. She works for, at that time, she was working for this uh, super wealthy dude who owned a bunch of dating sites. And um, he wanted a book that would, he was an, he's trained as an engineer. I think he went to MIT and, you know, he's super smart with the coding and, and obviously has some business acumen. 
Um, but he wanted a book that would sort of put him on the map as a, as a thinker about sexuality. Hmm. And so he wanted either that I would write a book that he would put his name on the cover or preferably that I would write a book and both our names would be on the cover, which would, you know, cause I wrote this book about sexuality. It's pretty yeah. well known. And so that would give him some street cred and, um, and they offered me uh, 50 grand. And I was like, you know, go hire a grad student. Like, yeah, you know, forget about 100%. it. Like, you know, if I'm going to spend time writing. Also, I have final say on whether my name's on the cover. So, Good. so it's going to be, I told them half a million and 200 grand paid up front. <laughs> I decide whether my name's on the cover at the end of the project based upon how it goes. The 200 grand is non-refundable. Good and, man. Because uh, this guy's worth over a billion yeah. dollars, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and you know, I've got my own shit to write. So if I'm going to yeah, take yeah. a year out of my life to do this for you, you're going to fucking pay for it. Yep. Um, and then, uh, and he was like, cool all right i'm down my lawyers will, will contact you next week with the paperwork and i was like all right look <laughs> that'll be that's just fine and uh, and then he got raided by the feds like two oh, days later no he got i wish <laughs> i wish you got that 200k then good <laughs> yeah, god <laughs> a week earlier it was, i said it was not refundable <laughs> yeah, oh, i would have had like you know people beating down my door or something yeah yeah, but that, well, that's as close as I've come to it. Well, it's funny you mention that because I just am noticing throughout this interview, you're you're very proficient at laying your ego aside. You're not talking over me, which is a faux pas. Like a lot of ghostwriters do that. Mm -hmm. um, you're a great interviewer and you're a great writer. You've got everything it takes to be a great ghostwriter. Except time and ambition. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Correct. Well, no, I, I mean, as you were describing it, 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 that's one of the reasons I asked about ego, because for me, ego has always been an impediment to my own writing. You know, like, I think you and I have, there's some parallels in our lives. Um, I think both of us sort of felt like uh, we had a voice at a pretty young age, as far as a written voice, yeah. uh, and some facility with that. And we probably both got a lot of encouragement uh, from older people who were like, dude, you could do this. Holy shit. You got it. You know, like that guy who gave you the list of a hundred books. He's like, ah, Hey, I see something here. But for me, it was when I was young and people would tell me, dude, you should write. I felt like a tall person that people kept saying you should play basketball. And it's like, eh, just cause you can do something doesn't mean you should. Right. And in my case, you know, maybe I have a more, um, I, you know, it's like someone who's, who sort of senses they might have a gambling problem should avoid casinos. Like maybe I've got a potential ego problem. So I've always felt like stay away from shit mm -hmm. that's going to feed your ego, um, junk food, you know? And so when I was 24, 25, I thought about writing, but it's like, why am I going to write? Why, why am I going to write? I'm going to write for, for money, for, to try to get famous, to be the next, you know, Brett Easton Ellis or something like, uh, I'm a fucking kid. I don't know anything. So um, I waited until I was almost 40 before I tried to get anything published. Damn. Do you yeah. regret that? I regretted it when that book became a bestseller and suddenly I wasn't, you know, counting every dime in my bank account. Um, and I was, you know, on TV and sort of having a good time and getting invited to cool parties and meeting all these interesting people. I regretted that, that that could have been really great 10 years earlier. Um, but I don't know that I would have handled it well 10 years earlier or that, or that I would have written something that would have had that sort of impact. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so regret's a weird thing, you know, cause it's like, well, you can, you can't really take something from one part of your life and just move it 
10 years earlier, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. So no, I don't regret it in any global sense. I definitely felt like, fuck, I wish, I wish this, I, I mean, I, I wish I had come to this party earlier because this is a great <laughs> party. <laughs> it's a fun party. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. So, uh, so how, so how did you get your first gig? Oh man, weird story. Um, I was working on a lobster boat because the money was running out. Right. My brothers are lobster fishermen. One of them is a captain. So I started helping him out. I became the first man. That's what they call it. And I hated that job. My God, I was breaking my body every day, working like 16 hours a day, throwing up when it would storm out and the, the swells were crazy. So wasn't having a great time, you could say. But one night I got home, checked my email and someone had written to me asking if I would ghostwrite the memoir. They said that they had seen my writing online on Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. They really liked it. So they said, I'll, I'll pay you to write my book. And I was like, fuck that. That's a scam. Spam. Threw it in the spam folder. It was like, no way. That's ridiculous. Like, what are they doing? Like coming after writers now? Like we have money. How can they scam us? This is stupid. Anyway, I kept going on the boat that week and it was haunting me. I was thinking about that, that email. What if it were true? And so I took it out of spam. I wrote back and the guy was legit and he hired me on, although he paid me, it was eight grand in the beginning. And for 21, that's pretty cool. You know, eight grand for four months is 2000 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. He paid me 2k up front. When it came time to pay me for the next batch, he said, Oh, I don't have the money, but I'll pay you in a bit. And that kept happening. And then I discovered mm -hmm. in his notes that he had intended to murder his ex-wife to hire someone to kill his ex-wife to gain custody of his kid. And I approached him about that because that didn't sit well with me. Wait, you and found he, this in his notes? Like yeah, what, like a journal he gave to you or something? Yep, yep, exactly. Fuck. Plans to do that. They were old plans, but they were plans nonetheless, you know. <laughs> he so, could be handing that shit out. You yeah, know? he didn't even know. He just <laughs> he, forgot. He forgot. Oh, yeah, shit. and I was like, so that, that meant that he fired me on the spot because I called him out for it. And I was flying back from that castle in Italy I was telling you about, Prince Stash. Um, my second ghostwriting client uh -huh. and you know i was in the airport and i was like jesus i just lost my only paying client and that sucked so because i learned he was a sociopath but instead of again like being afraid like oh my god what am i gonna do i just decided to be you know pragmatic and to build myself a website to put a, the last bit of money i had into an advertising account in google adwords and, you know, I spent a week just obsessively learning how to optimize my ads so they could be seen by the right people and new clients started coming in. And then, you know, it just kind of took off. Wow. So that was my first client. Yeah. He was and a prick. Did he have a good story? He had, he had a good story. Sorry if my stomach is growling. <laughs> uh, he, he had a great story. Um, he had a great story. He was a Cameroonian immigrant. And he had to go through so much shit to get to America, like a classic, beautiful immigrant story. I just didn't realize that there are these red flags all along the way. Mm. He talked about he, how he was the firstborn male. And in his culture, they would treat the firstborn male as a prince. They would get more food. They could, you know, do whatever the hell they wanted, basically. And, I, you know, I thought that's just culturally appropriate. Like I understood and I was researching that. But then it started bleeding into this guy's persona in other ways and the red flags, I just kept missing them. Mm. I didn't realize that he was a total covert narcissist. Mm. He, he was in love with himself and he felt he deserved whatever he wanted. Didn't matter if it hurt people or not. He, he earned it. He deserved it. Well, is, isn't narcissism built into the notion of hiring someone to write your life story for you? It could be. And for a lot of my old, older clients, it was a lot of very wealthy clients that have hired me. It's, it was, but nowadays I'm very lucky in that I only work with people I want to work with. And that's not a quality that they usually possess, mm. but now the quality that they have is I'm too busy. You know, I'm running all these companies. You know, I, I just don't have the time to write. I don't have the time to set aside five years and learn how to actually apply all of these lessons sure. to create a skill. So they're like, I, and I want to get this message out. And what's the message generally? It depends. Sometimes 
their memoirists who have had an incredible life, a, a very empowering story. Sometimes they're business executives and they founded very, very successful companies and they did it in a way that not a lot of business people do these days. So they're trying to show people, look, it's not just, you know, one plus one equals two. You can do it this way as well. So it's you like can, a Stephen King on writing, but in their field. Exactly. That's a really good way of putting it. Mm. And those are the stories that I look out for, the outliers, the, the people that are doing things differently, that go against the grain, that are controversial. Those are the ones that I'm attracted to because they're not like everybody else. Have you, do you find that you become friends with these people or are they just in such a different world that your reality and their reality can only intersect on the job? Yeah, I become friends with pretty much all of them now, which is interesting. When I first started this career, I read a book about ghostwriting. There are only a couple that are really worth their salt. And this one is one of them. And anyway, in that book, the guy says, you will never be friends with your clients. Don't even think about it, basically. You will think that you're friends, but you're not. But mm -hmm. for me, the experience has been completely the opposite. Right. Every single one of my clients, and we're talking, you know, very, very wealthy, very powerful people. Some of them, you know, there's a kid who's worth $55 million. He was 25 years old. He made that money almost overnight on crypto. And he's just this incredible, like genius autodidact. And, you know, we're really tight and just so many people, like one of the world's most famous hackers. Um, we're super tight. We talk all the time. We're good friends. Um, some of these people, my God, like uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine, a few years ago, she cheated on me with a woman, fell in love with the woman, left me for the woman. And it was this big like ego drain for me. I didn't know what I had done wrong. I didn't know how to interpret that situation. I didn't know. I just didn't know. And this person who'd had the same thing happen to him, the hacker, same thing. He called me up and he would talk to me for hours every week. And just, he was basically my therapist, this guy. And uh, I hold no ill will towards my ex, we're all friends, actually, my girlfriend and uh, loves her. And um, we're all we're close. But it was, uh, yes, it's just an amazing thing to be able to talk like that with your clients. When your woman leaves you for another woman, that's kind of a no fault situation. You know, I, I guess it depends. I think it partly was my fault. I was on this path. And, and maybe we'll talk about that is I was working with John McAfee. And I was defending a man who uh, was known to be a rapist and a murderer. And yeah. I was trying to find the truth of that. Right. I, I didn't defend him outright, but it really, it soured our relationship a bit because she thought like, can you use your common sense to know when someone is bad? She's, mm. she's thinking, can, do you just defend people who are bad so that you can get notoriety or money? Like, and that's not what I did, but I think in her mind, it scared her. And that wasn't why we broke up, you know, like she fell in love with somebody. Yeah. You can't control that. But to some degree, it certainly was my fault. But yeah. I see what you mean for sure. Yeah. I mean, I was being a little flippant, you know, like if, if the idea is that, you know, she finds a, an aspect of her sexuality that's more about other women, like, uh, yeah, you know, there's nothing you're going to do about that. Oh, it's, totally. It's like my partner's father is gay and, uh, you know, when he split up with her mother, he said like, look, you know, I thought I was bi, but actually I'm gay. And it's like, there's no arguing with that, you know, no, it's, that is a, what it is. The ultimate, like, it's not you, it's me situation. Yeah. That is the ultimate situation where that actually is true. Cause a yeah. lot of people say it's not you, it's me, but it's really, it's not me. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, uh, uh let's let's jump ahead a bit to, sure. to McAfee so I mean ostensibly that's the reason for doing the podcast but you know I you mentioned earlier like the you know interviewing styles and all that I, for me you've done a lot of hitchhiking I've done a lot of hitchhiking mm -hmm. for me what I love about podcasting is it's like hitchhiking it's like you get into a car with someone and you're like all right let's find you know, let's pull the story out of this person and, and give them yeah. space to, you know. Um, so I'm probably more interested in you than I am in John McAfee. But, <laughs> you know, I feel like we have to have to put some focus in, into that. Uh, 
how, how did that come about? Was that sort of a typical business thing or, or did you uh, run into him at the prince's house or how did that work? <laughs> uh, it was a weird story how it happened. Um, long story short, I started getting into crypto 2017. I got hacked. I was in Germany and I've been a ghostwriter for like five years now. I had, I had had some successes and some failures. I made some good money. I was a ghostwriter full time and I was still advertising. And so one of my ads got hacked and that malicious ad was blockchain, something, something. I was like, what the hell is blockchain? So I started researching it as I was trying to get my ad accounts live again. And I became fascinated by it. I read the white paper by the, um, the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto, who I believe I met. That's another story. Mm. Um, who created Bitcoin. And I was enamored by this technology and the fact that it could sort of reinvent our current paradigm. So all these people who are in control of us and everything, they're no longer on control. It's flipped 180 degrees and they're at the bottom and we're at the top. I love that, that we could possibly regain our autonomy and our freedom and through this incredible software and technology. So I, I thought, you know, what the hell? I saw that crypto was like, on a tear. This is maybe December, 2017. So I threw in $2,500 randomly and I got $33,000 in six days. And I thought, holy shit, what is going on here? And that was great. And then it crashed it happens, but I was still enamored with it. So I, I started researching it a lot and I started working with people in crypto and obviously John's name, it was always popping up. He was one of the most pr prominent voices in cryptocurrency and blockchain. And so I wrote to Jimmy Watson, his executive advisor on LinkedIn or something. I said, Hey, I am a ghostwriter. I think John has an incredible story. I would love to help tell it. Is he already Jimmy, in, in Honduras at this time? Oh, you mean Belize? Belize? Yeah. Yeah. So he left Belize in 2012 when the, when he was wanted for questioning over the murder of Greg Fall, he left, went on the run. He never went back. Okay. And there are reasons why. Right. Um, he was in Tennessee. Yeah. He had a, an estate in Tennessee at this point. Anyway, we started talking, Jimmy and I, back and forth for several months. And he was interested in me. He liked my story. But he said, oh, you know, man, like boss, he said no to every writer for the last 12 years. He thinks writing is stupid. Books are stupid. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, you know, just let's feel it out. And then when he told John that I had been homeless... John perked up and he said, Jimmy, uh, get him on the phone. And so I got a call at like 5.30 in the morning and I was preparing <laughs> coffee and I was just so groggy and tired. Uh, I didn't know the number. Um, so I answered the phone and he said, hello, this is John McAfee. And I said, Jesus Christ. I was like, uh, uh, hi, uh, hi, John. How's it going? And he said, I have a question for you, sir. I said, sure. He said, do you drink? I said, uh, like water, milk, uh, alcohol, juice. What are we talking here? And he said, booze, son. Do you drink booze? And I said, yes, I do. What do you drink? Um, I like whiskey, scotch, bourbon. I love those. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of white wine. I like red wine, like Montepulciano, blah, blah. And he was like, okay, good. I will see you, uh, I will see you tomorrow. And I was like, what the? F and he like handed the phone to Jimmy. And Jimmy was like, uh holy shit Alex uh yeah I guess you're in bro uh you better fly here tomorrow and that's how I met John so on your own dime you flew to Tennessee I did and then I got a, an envelope with a stack of cash like two thousand bucks which was like twice as much as I had paid um Jimmy handed it to me when I walked in the door he was like here you go man I said oh, oh okay thanks cool you know I don't have to pay for my travel right I did in the end I, I met with John several times with the last time I spent geez like seven and a half grand traveling with him throughout Europe and they were supposed to pay me back but they never did and then we fired each other <laughs> yeah you I, know. I found that uh working with very wealthy people can be very expensive oh my god yeah yeah it can I think that's why I was so kind of adamant with the dude who wanted me to write that book with him I was like money on in my account or I'm, you know, 
nothing else matters promises exactly fuck that i know about rich people promise oh yeah that's the way you got to operate because you're in their world now so you yeah. got to operate the way that they do right and it's the same way you know what if they stick you with a five or ten thousand dollar bill at this incredible restaurant in ibiza you know yeah. and or they they get sick or they get tired and they got to go go to bed and they're like hey you take care of this like you got to have enough money in your account to cover that yeah. my god so yeah, yeah. 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 I could tell you stories. I worked for I've... a millionaire for a while when I was in my early twenties. Ooh. Yeah. That was a weird one. But anyway, jo so John, so, so you go down there, you meet him. He's a fucking abrupt billionaire eccentric. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how do you broach? How, how do you get into like, okay, we're going to do a project together. So I was there for a little over a week, that first trip. And yeah, John was very elusive at first. He, he would hide behind this solid steel door in his bedroom. You know, uh, it was like bulletproof and everything. And yeah. he would come out at random, random times throughout the night. Like the first night I was there, I didn't think I was even going to meet him. Jimmy said he was going to show up when he wanted to. And what was um, his relationship with Jimmy? Had they known each other a long time? No, five months. Jimmy started out as security, but Jimmy's uh, a very intelligent person. And so he kind of worked his way up onto Team Mac into Team McAfee, became executive advisor. By the end of his tenure there, he was the CEO of Team McAfee. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think he was paranoid his whole life? And that's how he got into antivirus protection? Or did he become paranoid because he had so much money and shit just got distorted and, and blown up? That's an excellent question. And so now we're going to get into the deep shit, some of which is in the film. And they're the bombshells that I learned while I was working with John. So John shot his father. John's father committed suicide and when John was 15 years old. However, while I was with John interviewing him, I kept hearing all these stories about how his dad beat the shit out of him and broke his arms and beat the hell out of his mother. Mm. And anyway, one day it just got into my head and it wouldn't leave because I had a similar experience growing up. And I had thought those thoughts before. I didn't ever do anything about it, but I had thought them. And so I brought it up to Jimmy because the night before we were all at dinner and we were on the run at this point. And John had said, like, I, uh, you know, he said, my, my dad used to beat on me, broke my arms and beat on my mom to the point I did something about it. I was like, whoa, what did you do about it? And he was like, oh, I, I, um, like, he just like backed up and skipped over it. And so it was in my head and I brought it up to Jimmy and I said, hey, Jimmy, like, I have a feeling that John shot his father. And Jimmy looked at me like, how the fuck do you know that, Alex? Nobody knows that. But like, like nobody knows that. But I, I said, whoa, Jimmy, I didn't know that, but now I do. And then he proceeded to tell me the story. You know, John was 15. His grandfather, who he loved, who had passed away, gave him like this rifle or something. And anyway, John had told his dad, like, you do this again, I will fucking kill you. Beat the shit out of John for saying that. So then John... Um, John went to, I think it was the bathroom is like dad was shaving and he like pointed the rifle at his father and his father saw him in the mirror and he's like, you're not going to do that. Pow, shot his dad in the head, killed him instantly. And he was like freaking out, crying. He ran over to the neighbor or something. The neighbor basically, he knew that John and his mother had been severely abused by this man. He said, you did not shoot your father. Your father shot himself in the back he committed of the suicide. Yeah. I, <laughs> I want to get the ballistics. Like I've been trying to for yeah. months, but it's, it's really difficult. Was um, this in, I, in Kentucky or Tennessee or where did he grow up? Uh, he grew up like in Appalachia. This was in, um, right. I believe this was in Tennessee right. or Virginia. So but, presumably um, the cops knew what a prick his father was. So maybe yeah. they, they were happy to let it slide. It might, and this, this is back in the day, you know, right. this is yeah. what, in the 50, 60s or, or so. Um, it might not have been the back of the head, you know, since he might have turned, it might have been right here, so, mm. which would have been more believable if it was in the forehead. 
But anyway, Jimmy told me that he said he confirmed my su suspicion that John had shot his father. And you got to think what that does to a 15 year old child when you at that age, when you're still not finished developing, you you're a murderer. And maybe you're always wondering if you're going to get found out. And right. so years down the line, when he was older and he saw this opportunity, John was always one to capitalize on opportunities. He saw all these viruses and he, I think, was paranoid that they would take over the world and he could create this software that could protect everybody, mm. which was ironic because ultimately he built a back door in that software, which could spy on anyone in the world, really? which is why he's so paranoid. Yeah. Oh. Uh, exactly uh yeah he so the paranoia continues because right. he not only is he the creator of the eponymous antivirus software the mcafee antivirus software he now has direct intel to the kgb the cia the fbi the white house the kremlin like everywhere he can get into their computers he can get their documents he can get above top secret information and he did and he saw things few people in the world could see because he could see it all. So in a way, John McAfee for a time was the most powerful man in the world because mm. he had the most damning information on everybody. And that's what I discovered as well. And that freaked me the fuck out because at first I thought he was just paranoid, crazy, you know, on drugs or something. We're on the run. And he keeps saying we're on the run from the cartel. I'm like, yeah, that's bullshit. And I, then I found out we actually were on the run from the cartel because when he was in Belize, he had hired a bunch of prostitutes to basically gift them laptops that was infect that were infected with keylogging software to hack the Belizean government. And it was during this time that he discovered that the Belizean government allegedly um, was working with the cartel. So John knew one one of the heads of the Sinaloa cartel from Belize, a guy named John. Should I not mention this on the air? Probably not. It's okay. up to you. It's up to you. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I'll but... just keep that one. But uh, yeah. he knew one of the heads of the Sinaloa cartel. I talked with the guy on the phone one time when we were on the run. And we were being pursued in, in a, a car I saw with a pair of Hispanic people, um, Hispanic guys. They had been following us. And I told John about it. He looked at their license plate up. And he was like, yep, it's a cartel. It's like goes to a dummy corporation. Um, I know these guys, I know what they're doing, why they're after me. I was like, why the fuck are they after you? I don't, I don't really believe you. And then he told me the story. He hacked them. Right. He had their information. So he's got all this information. Like, how does that make him a target rather than incredibly well protected? It's a little bit of both. What he told me during that trip about the cartel was that they didn't know what he had on them. And so there could have been a number of reasons why they were tailing him. It was to keep tabs on him, to make sure at all times they know where he is so that if there becomes an opportunity where he's vulnerable enough, they can scoop him up and start taking off his fingers in a windowless room with plastic on the floor until he divulges what he knows, like then they'll take that opportunity. Or it's just to know where he is at all times, you know, um, or it's to intimidate him because they can't just kill him. If they kill him, he could release that information. Right. That, so it could have just been they want to they want to keep him scared because they're pissed off. They're like, man, this guy, he fucked with us. We got to fuck with him, too. But there are lines that we can't cross. So we'll just scare him. Mm. And he was scared. He was paranoid a lot. And like assuming this is all true, right, that he so he he did the coding himself. He he was an engineer. Yep. He yeah. had worked with NASA. He had worked with Lockheed. Um, he got his start. God, it's in my book, but I've been writing this for so many months. Um, with like IBM, that's where he first started learning about how to code. And he was just right. enraptured by the idea. So he wrote the McAfee software in like two days. The first generation of that, he wrote in just a couple of days. And that's like what, the mid 90s or something? This was the late 80s. Oh, late 80s. So this is before yeah, the that he wrote it. is even really yeah. happening on a public mm -hmm. level yeah yeah i think it was late late 80s when he first got into writing this software and then it was in the early 90s when he actually built mcafee um built it up into a corporation right, right. yeah 
So, so he writes this back door in, which must have seemed like a really clever idea at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, then his software takes off. You know, maybe, maybe at the time he's thinking like, I can look at you know, girls' nude pictures of themselves or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then the Kremlin installs the software and the CIA or or whatever. Uh, that must have felt like he had a tiger by the tail there. Like, you know, this is working out way too well. And now I can't let go because I need to protect myself because they're going to figure this out at some point. Exactly. He, yeah. I think because of his monstrous ego, he, he just, he, he gets off on manipulating people and, and stealing secrets and knowing everything he can about a person. And so he loved it. it. It fueled his ego and he felt powerful, but then he realized he had gone way past the point of no return and he, he just couldn't go back. What and kind of snooping up. around uh, did he do into you? Do you think? I was, I was um, in the outer banks when we just bought like this mansion, you know, we, we were still on the run. He was undercover and stuff and he was presenting himself to everybody as James Ivy. And anyway, I was, I was talking with Jimmy about some of the stuff that was going on because there's some dangerous things happening. And I said, I feel like he's like hacked us, man. Like, my God, like he probably is listening to everything we say right now. And he was like, bro, he has. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, like last night, he showed me on his phone, everybody's phones, all of our phones, all of our text messages. He said, I saw something you wrote to Leah about being like at the beach or some shit. And I was like, yeah, I did say that. Oh my God. And so he said, yeah, man, he's got everything. So you need to be very vigilant and very careful about what you say, mm -hmm. you know? So I think if you were in John's circle, you were immediately suspicious, you know, he was suspicious of you. He had yeah. to be, I guess. Right. Cause you could have been working for a cartel or for the, or the FBI. FBI. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. that's the perfect kind of insertion, right? Yep. He thought I was an undercover FBI agent at first, I guess, because I was like clean cut and fit. Right. And the way I looked and the way that I talked, he thought at first that's that's what I was. Did you worry that your life could be in danger, either from him or from <laughs> anyone that was after him? That's the thing, Chris, and it's weird, but going back to the yeah. The whole lack of that fear. I was never right. afraid. It was, right. and here's the weird part. You know, I said, I, I stopped feeling excitement. I stopped feeling fear in that traditional sense. I stopped feeling nervousness. But when I was with John, there was this emotion that I've never been able to categorize, but it was sort of like excitement. It was mm. like, it was something being breathed back into me. Right. But I didn't know what it was, but no, I was on the run. And some of the people we were with, they're terrified. They're like, oh my God, we're really on the fucking run. They didn't know what to believe. But when I found out, I was just shocked and surprised. But then I thought, shit, this is so much fun. You know, I had a gun on me. Like I got a gun on my, on my side. You know, I was like, this is crazy. I'm, it's like living in a movie. I've never, never thought I would experience this. So I was just, I was along for the ride at that point. What about now? Are you now worried that someone's going to come to you chopping off your fingers because they think you know where this information is where the thumb drive is you know? i thought about that i thought about that a lot and it's very weird that you you work with this paranoid man for so long there's this very amazing scene there's in um in this movie uh what was it called uh, the departed scorsese movie right and dicaprio is talking about how he's been undercover for so long with this mass murderer and he he goes like this and he says you know you're seeing this mass murderer and your hands are still that's kind of how i felt and i never knew why i felt that and now i look back and i just think i'm fucking stupid and crazy and why did i ever put myself in a situation like that that could endanger my loved ones and so I was very worried for a while after John had passed, you know, I had a gun. I, I walked around my house. I never left with a clip in one pocket and the gun in the other pocket. It did not leave my person just like John. And I felt myself like inheriting his intense paranoia. 
But at the same time, after he passed away, there was this black drone that was overhead every day, real close to my house. I'd never seen it before. And I was just dreading one of two things, a stranger showing up at my house who I did not want to meet or opening my mailbox and seeing there's a package with a USB drive because John left me one of his supposed dead man switches would, which would make me a dead man. I was terrified, I guess, not terrified, but I was very cautious. I was very much dreading the potential of either of those scenarios. It didn't happen. Yeah. Why and would then, that make you a dead man to, to have that? Because you think other people would have known that it I think they would, have, they would have find, found out. Right. Yeah, I feel like they would have found out. And if you have that information, you're out, you're gone. And I don't have that information in my head. That information is in the Netflix documentary. It's in the book that I'm producing. Um, so the information is public. And therefore, the, the info that I possess, it should not put a target on my back. However, after John, um, after the Netflix trailer released, that black drone was right back here for two days. Mm -hmm. And I had sent a video to a friend of mine who's in the army. He confirmed to me that it was a military drone. So it was very weird. So while I don't think that I'm in any danger because I don't pose a threat to any of these supposed enemies that John had, um, I'm still cautious, you know, I'm vigilant. Right but I don't believe that I'm in any danger. I mean, I shouldn't be if they know better, like whoever has those dead man switches would be the one in danger if those exist even. What's the relationship between your book and the Netflix special? So, geez, I didn't want to write this book. <laughs> uh, writing this book has been like reliving weird trauma that I forgot about. And, and therefore the whole thing has been like this ongoing therapy session with myself mm. which is a very interesting feeling um i never wanted to write the book i never wanted to be in a movie i never really want to talk about john again but i uh the filmmakers reached out to me because they said they kept hearing my name pop up and then they talked to me and they're like holy shit you know more about john than anybody we've met we need you alex and i thought ah, i don't know i don't know if i want to talk about these things i don't know if i want to be a face in this film and talk about this information, which could maybe put me in danger. Um, but I ended up feeling good about it. And I really love the filmmaker. So I went ahead and did it. And then John passed away. He allegedly committed suicide. And again, a bunch of people from New York started reaching out to me. Agencies that I had pitched for like eight years, they started coming to me. And one of them I really liked, and I really respected. And I went with him and I loved the guy. So a liter um, literary agent? A literary agent, yep. Right. And I didn't want to tell the story. But but anyway, it, it became a two-tiered thing because I was giving Netflix 5 or 10% of the overall story. And it wasn't enough. And they did a phenomenal job with the film. I went and see it in London a couple months ago, a pre-screening. They did a phenomenal job, but obviously like there's not enough space in an hour and 45 minutes to include all of that information right. and the whole thing when i was being filmed and talking about these things it it was very cathartic it felt great so i i said what the hell i'll write a book too and the book is part memoir you know part one is called the ghost writer it's about my time mm -hmm. you know losing my mind how i became this ghost writer and then part two is called the subject and yeah. it's all about utilizing my storytelling capacity in my broken mind and my ghostwriting skills to enter enter the world of John McAfee. Right. So they're kind of they're very much linked. There's just more information in the book than in the film. What's the book called? It's called The Man Who Hacked the World: A Ghostwriter's Descent into Madness with John McAfee. Right. A ghostwriter sent. That's an. I like that descent cool. into madness because it's like, is it your madness or his madness or the two Both. of you descending yeah. together? Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's great. And when's the I, book come out? It comes out April 4th. It's on pre-sale right now. I don't know. It's like $2 off. Like that matters. But yeah, it can, comes out April 4th, 2023. Interesting. And I hope it doesn't suck. We shall see. Are you done with it? I'm finishing tonight. Oh, shit. Yeah. I got the last few bits of polishing to do. And I turn into my publisher tomorrow. Dude. 
That's yeah. awesome. I'm honored it's to be here with you. I'm honored to be here with you. <laughs> I was I was su surprised when you gave me your potential dates and that this one worked because it's you know my last day of writing. It's very fitting. Funny. Well, it's my last day of Wi-Fi for at least the <laughs> next few weeks. You lucky man. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm gonna let you uh, get to work. I'd hate to sure. to have you miss your deadline because of me. <laughs> all good. I think I'm all set. Don't worry. But this is awesome, it. dude. Thank you. I really enjoyed. I I rarely enjoy talking to people through a fucking computer screen. So, uh, <laughs> me too. Know, it's uh, it's an unusual thing, but hopefully we'll be able to have a beer sometime in in the same room at some point. I know that we will. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, I'll make it. Hey, cool. So, all right, we'll talk uh through text or whatever you let me know when you want to release this sure. whatever you know netflix wants or if you want to hold it for the book or whatever that's fine too thanks um, chris totally down to support however i can really appreciate you man I've, I've loved this conversation i had a great time i just now i want to learn more about you i want to hear your story so when we yeah. have that beer yeah we got to get that beer because like so yeah. so i mean i'm 30 years older than you, but I think we sort of approach life the same way. Uh, Me too. You know, in my case, I, I went to prison in Alaska for four days, just four days, but yeah. it was a prison, an actual, not a jail. It was a prison. Um, and that was a, a pivotal change in my life where I kind of was like, <laughs> I mean, strangely, it wasn't it wasn't uh, that I, I'll never go to prison again. It was more like, these dudes are pretty cool. And like, <laughs> I was totally wrong about, you yeah. know, who's cool and who isn't cool in, <laughs> in life. Uh, but that's another story. But I, I sort of just, you know, I was 20 at the time. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just float around the world for the next 10 years. And I'm not going to commit to anything and no woman, no job, no grad school, no nothing, you know, that's going to pin me down to anything and we'll see what happens. Wow. And so it's similar to, similar yeah. to your, your trajectory. Absolutely. I want to pick your brain about that. I'll have to fly out to wherever you are at some point um, this fall. Yeah. Well, when, I'll have some more time. When things clear up. Yeah. I'll yeah. be, I'll be in the van. I've got a van, Scarlett yeah. Johansson. Uh, I'll be <laughs> traveling around. Uh, from until the snows really until November and then I might Excellent. be in Mexico for the month of November but then I'll be in Colorado for the winter I think so, wow okay I'll come I'll come see it because yeah. I'm gonna have a lot more time after September so. yeah cool all right well let's do that <laughs>